Chapter Six of Julia Reed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Julia Reed by Pansy. Chapter Six, in which I meet the other side of the question. I had intended to go directly to my room, but the wide, hospitable hall was brightly lighted, and the folding doors were thrown open, giving a glimpse of the parlor and Mrs. Tyndall alone in one of the great easy chairs with her inevitable bit of bright-colored fancy-work lying idly on her lap. "'I was just wishing for your arrival,' she said winningly. "'Mr. Tyndall is late this evening, and I am the most social of mortals. I don't like being alone.' As she spoke she wheeled forward, with a touch of her hand, another of the easy chairs, and into it I sank. "'You poor victim,' she said, eyeing me compassionately. It is really inconsiderate in Dr. Douglas to smuggle you away with him to that little den of a schoolroom. I believe I shall have to tell him so. I hope you were interested. I certainly was, I answered with spirit, for the tone of her voice jarred on the mood which I had brought in with me. I never find a prayer meeting other than interesting. I trust I never shall. Is it so? she said with a little touch of wonderment in her tone. I confess I should not agree with you. I think there are, or at least there should be, prayer meetings, like sermons or books, adapted to various intellects and capacities, and what might be eminently suited to the class for which it was calculated might not be particularly edifying to me. It is a new idea to me, I said, that there are different intellectual gauges for prayer meetings. I thought they, at least, were in favor of equality of race." Yes, she answered quietly, it seems to be a fact not taken into consideration by many people, and herein, I think, lies the main cause of so many failures to do good to certain classes of people. We try, in this one matter of religion, to lift people up above their intellectual capacity, or else drag them below it, and of the two, I really think the latter the more disastrous. Tonight, sitting here in my room, Looking back upon this conversation, I can take in at a glance all the ridiculous sophistry embodied in Mrs. Tyndall's words. But then I could not do it. I know that they sounded not right, that they were unlike Dr. Douglas, unlike my mother, unlike Dr. Mulford's face, and yet they seemed plausible. I answered nothing, and Mrs. Tyndall continued. It is rather a singular meeting, I have been told. Kate, my upstairs girl, is a regular attendant, much to my inconvenience, I must say. However, of course, I am willing to sacrifice my own personal convenience if the girl is really going to get any good. She sometimes waxes quite eloquent over the meetings, and I hear her giving the cook some strange reports of the proceedings. They all talk, girls and all, so she says. Of course, I don't more than half credit Kate's reports. I have too high an opinion of Dr. Douglas's good sense to believe all that she says. But you, poor little victim, I have been feeling sorry for you all the evening. Dr. Douglas's class attend quite regularly, I am told, and they, as I told you, are shop girls, or something of that sort. Then two of Mr. Tyndall's office boys are always there, and an admirer of Kate's who works at the printing office, and all of the boys from the mill, and, dear me, I don't know who else. Quite a conglomeration, you perceive. But what could have possessed Dr. Douglas to mix you in with all that class of people, I cannot imagine. A confusion of motives prompted my reply. I did not like to hear Dr. Douglas blamed. I certainly did not like the idea of being mixed with people not proper for me to mix with. I had greatly enjoyed the meeting, but in view of Mrs. Tyndall's evident belief in my superiority over the others whom I had met, I didn't like to own it. And yet I was half angry with Mrs. Tyndall for jarring upon the lofty impulses with which I had entered the room not ten minutes before. Governed by all these feelings combined, I answered coldly, These people all have souls, I presume, notwithstanding the fact that they are office boys and upstairs girls. I fancy that Dr. Douglas takes that fact into consideration. Mrs. Tyndall arched her eyebrows and sent her gleaming crochet needle several times through the meshes of her work before she answered me, prefacing her words by a light laugh. Let us hope that they have, my dear, 
though some of them certainly act as though souls were the very last articles they imagined themselves possessing. However, that is only one reason more why they are in need of instruction, and I really hope you do not misinterpret my words. I'm sure I think the meeting an excellent thing, one which, if rightly managed, may be considered a great blessing to these poor creatures. No one can possibly admire Dr. Douglas's devotion to them more than I do, though at the same time I cannot see how he can possibly spare the time that he gives to them from his profession, and that, of course, he would never neglect. Oh, I assure you, I am a staunch admirer of Dr. Douglas. What I am scolding him for is the unnecessary martyrdom to which he has subjected you. That certainly is quite unnecessary, his own sacrifice is amply sufficient. Now, my dear, I see you are going to assure me that there wasn't the least bit of martyrdom about it, that you never thought of such a thing. I can see it in your bright eyes, and besides, I know how you young enthusiasts talk. Now you must let me give you a little bit of advice, just as an older sister would, my dear. As Christians grow older, they come to realize that there is a common sense side to this question. We may talk about equality and sigh for it, and remind each other that all people have souls, and yet, in spite of it all, equality does not exist, and never will as long as people are made with different sized brains. Now just look at the thing. Here is my Kate, a good-hearted a creature as ever lived, and undoubtedly she has a soul, and you and I wish her well. But do you really believe that either of us would particularly enjoy it if I should invite her in to spend the evening with us? Go farther than that. Do you imagine she would enjoy it herself? Shouldn't we succeed in making three very uncomfortable people all for the sake of a quixotic idea? And that is precisely what enthusiasts are doing the world over, only they don't bring their ideas down to everyday life so people can realize their ridiculousness. I assure you there is nothing like a little practical common sense to show people the folly of their flights into utopia. She muttered this last sentence with a triumphant little nod of her shapely head, and in a tone that plainly said, There, I have given you an unanswerable argument. Oh, that I, Julia Reed, could have been gifted just then and there with a little of that vaunted common sense, so that I might have shown to her the ridiculous flight that she had been taking, and all because Dr. Douglas had invited me to attend a prayer meeting, instead of which I was suddenly plunged into a bewildering maze. This awful social question loomed up before me mountain high, met me like a stern fate at every turn, was even connected, it seemed, with a quiet little prayer meeting, though how or why my brain refused to show me. Uppermost among my thoughts was a comical vision of Kate, Mrs. Tyndall's red-cheeked, giggling upstairs girl, sitting bolt upright in one of Mrs. Tyndall's crimson chairs, her large red hands engaged in her favorite occupation, that of knitting coarse blue yarn socks for numerous brothers at home, and vainly trying to sustain her part in the conversation. Herein, I believe, lay much of the wonderful power which Mrs. Tyndall exerted over those who came under her influence, the art of painting with skillful touches, a picture that might or might not have anything to do with the question at issue, but with a point to it so ludicrous or grotesque that it would seem to have everything to do with the argument, and which would loom up for you to laugh over or flush over so soon as ever you tried to seriously weigh the question. Mrs. Tyndall turned deftly to another phase of the subject. Now, Miss Reed, I really must confess to a little vulgar curiosity on one point. I have not liked to question Kate, because I never descend of talking over matters with my girls. But do the girls really have anything to say in these meetings? They certainly do, I said shortly, feeling vexed at myself and at her, and hardly understanding my reason for the feeling. What? Right out during the meeting, in plain English? I laughed a little. Why, Mrs. Tyndall, they are all Americans, I think. You do not suppose they are gifted with tongues for the occasion, do you? She laughed also, her low musical laugh, as she said, Now, you naughty sprite, I believe you are hoaxing me. Won't you tell me honestly? I have answered you with perfect honesty. There were nearly a dozen spoke this evening, I should think. I will not attempt to describe Mrs. Tyndall's face as she asked her next question. My dear Miss Reed, do you ever take part in these meetings? 
I often have, I answered, a little triumphant defiance in my voice. But you did not tonight, I am sure? Anxiety and suspense in her voice. I am sure I did, Mrs. Tyndall. Why not? I assure you it is not more than I have done many times before. Mrs. Tyndall dropped her glowing worsted in her lap, and clasped her small, fair hands with a mixture of surprise and dismay. This is really too bad in Dr. Douglas, she said at last. I am astonished at him. I do not see how he could have thought it right. I answered her in a cold, hard tone. I beg, Mrs. Tyndall, that you will not consider Dr. Douglas to be at fault for every movement that I make. It is certainly on my own responsibility that I took part in the meeting this evening, and I have done nothing of which I am ashamed, nothing but what I have heard my own mother and my sister who is in heaven do many times. Mrs. Tyndall returned to her worsteds, and her voice was as sweet as a bell when she answered, My dear child, forgive the pet name, but you are so young and sweet and innocent. Don't fancy that I am blaming you. Your home has been in a quiet little village, and since you have been educated in that manner, nothing was more natural than for you to continue your old custom to-night. But you must let me be just a little provoked with Dr. Douglas. He really should have informed you of the views which the Society of Newton take of such matters. Dr. Douglas knows perfectly well that here it is considered in a high degree immodest and unladylike, and it was certainly unkind in him not to tell you so. You, of course, are not in the least to blame. I think my cheeks vied with the worsted in color as I responded. Will you be kind enough to inform me why Newton should have such terms concerning so simple a matter as speaking a half-dozen words in a quiet little prayer meeting? Mrs. Tyndall shrugged her beautiful shoulders. My dear little Puritan, she said lightly, what a task you have set before me. I don't pretend to understand all the reasons. There are many people, you know, who consider it morally wrong, and quote St. Paul with energy. Of course, all such ideas are nonsensical, have been exploded indeed. I personally always believed that people's consciences should guide them aright in this as in other matters. My conscience, I am happy to say, has never obliged me to speak in meeting. I don't think it ever will. But I certainly think that there is one important objection always to be considered. Public opinion is decidedly against hearing our voices in religious meetings, and I, for one, feel that my influence is too precious to be thrown away. Oh, my dear, if you could hear the many laughable things that I have heard about this matter, you would never open your lips again in religious meetings. Whether I consider it right or wrong? I asked. Oh, but you would feel it to be wrong, or at the very least inexpedient. That is a Bible word, you know, my dear. I think the influence it has on the unconverted is most unfortunate. They invariably ridicule it. I never heard any one do so, I said stiffly. Ah, but my dear innocent child, you must constantly remember the difference in places. Newton is peculiar in many respects, I will admit. There are, perhaps, more educated persons here than generally congregate in places of its size, people of wealth and culture, you know, who have had every advantage of society, and that class of people, you will find, feel very strongly on the subject. My dear, I really must tell you of my experience in listening to people of my own sex in mixed assemblies. At this point Mr. Tyndall sauntered in, and dropped into an easy chair beside his wife. What is the subject under discussion, my dear? he asked briskly. Anything that masculinity can appreciate, or must I retire? Decidedly you can appreciate it. Oh, Mr. Tyndall, I must tell you. Dr. Douglas has beguiled this dear little Puritan into making a speech to his boys and girls tonight. Several feelings struggled within me for the mastery, among which were indignation and embarrassment, and while I was struggling for calmness, Mr. Tyndall responded by a low, quick whistle, then laughed and said good-humoredly, I beg your pardon, ladies, nothing else would express my state of mind. Dr. Douglas is a shrewd man, wise in his generation. I would almost sit an hour in that dreadful schoolroom myself for the pleasure of hearing your voice, Miss Reed. So that is the spell which is brought to bear upon my office boys. I have often wondered. I was just about to tell Miss Reed of our experience with Mrs. Hilliard, 
Do you remember Mrs. Hilliard, Mr. Tyndall? I am inclined to think I do. Let us have the story by all means. I am in a state of mind to appreciate it. She was a little wizened up woman, Miss Reed, with just the very squeakiest voice that you can imagine, and she invariably had a cold in her head. Well, she was the solitary female who used to honor us with her experience at prayer meeting. Mr. Tyndall and I sat directly behind her and had a fair view. She always addressed her remarks to the ceiling, and used to roll her eyes in this manner. And Mrs. Tyndall clasped her hands, and, fixing her gaze on the wall overhead, rolled her beautiful eyes until nothing but white was visible, and drew a prolonged sigh, an indescribable sound, produced by a long drawn-out letter A suddenly dropped into space. "'Give us the speech, Fanny,' said her husband, laughing immoderately. "'Oh, the speech was nothing, the same words nearly, but the manner was unique. This was the opening sentence. "'My dear brethren, ah, ah,' a very long, drawn breath between these two words, "'and sisters, I feel, ah, uh, that I must give voice to my heart to-night. I feel, ah, uh, that—' and here she invariably had recourse to her handkerchief. "'I feel that the spiritual part of this meeting depends upon the sisters. I feel to lament my cold state. I feel that we must wake up and do our duty.' I have always from a child been ridiculously susceptible to ludicrous impressions, and on this evening, although my cheeks were burning with indignation over the language in which Mrs. Tyndall had been indulging, although I felt the utter fallacy of her arguments, yet at this picture, rolling eyes, nasal tone, long-drawn breaths, and finally voice changing into a whine, with sobs and chokings, and frequent applications of the handkerchief, I joined hopelessly in the laugh. Mr. Tyndall enjoyed the exhibition immensely, and went away laughing to attend to a business call. His wife's face became grave almost instantly, and she drew a little sigh and spoke in a saddened tone. I have not exaggerated the picture in the least, Miss Reed. Mr. Tyndall used to accompany me to prayer meeting quite frequently in those days, and that is exactly the sort of martyrdom he was called upon to endure and I am sure you cannot wonder that he has entirely given up the habit of attending prayer meeting. My brain was in a whirl when I went to my room that evening. I do not know that I was more easily led than other girls of my age. I did not entirely believe in Mrs. Tyndall. I saw through many of her sophistries, but at the same time there were many that I did not see through, and everything about her had a sort of fascination to me. I felt myself insensibly slipping away from my moorings. I sat down, Bible in hand, and tried to read, but it is safe to say that I read only what Mrs. Tyndall had been saying, and laughed a little over her picture of Mrs. Hilliard, even while I had sense to realize that with such home comments as Mr. Tyndall heard, it was not strange that he lost faith in prayer meetings. One thing I did that evening, for which I am glad. I copied and retained a copy of every word that I could remember about that young people's meeting, to which copy I am indebted for the account of it that I have written tonight. End of chapter 6 Recording by Tricia G.